Uh, good afternoon. Like I said, my name is Eric Wright. I'm an education specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, and we are totally glad that everybody decided to join us today for our last curator conversations of the month of May for 2021. Uh, before we get started, though, I just want to say a, a great thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation. They do a great job of sponsoring us for all these free events, and funding for this event is made possible uh, through the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Veterans Museum Foundation uh, through the generous support of Generac Power Systems. Um, and I just want to say an extra special thank you to the Foundation's Executive Director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson, for all the great work that she does for the museum and for these fantastic events that we have. Kudos. Um, we are going to be joined today by the Museum Director, uh, Chris Kolakowski, and also by our Curator of History, Mr. Kevin Hampton. And they are going to be talking about uh, the exhibits uh, that we have throughout the museum and how we've changed that or are looking to change it um, as we welcome everybody back to the museum, hopefully within uh, the next month and a half, two months. Um, but we're gonna be looking at how the staff has reimagined the permanent exhibit presentations uh, and refresh some of the stories that we tell at the museum. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters, you can submit those via the chat function uh, and we will get those questions submitted into a, a PowerPoint presentation that we'll bring up at the end. So if you have any questions at all about uh, the museum or anything that our guests are talking about today, please submit those via the chat function on Zoom. Um, and with that out of the way, I will turn the floor over uh, to our museum director, Mr. Chris Kolokowski. Uh, Chris, the floor is all yours, sir. Hey, thank you, Eric. And thanks everybody for coming today. Um, and for your interest in what we're doing. Um, the, the, this conversation came out of some questions we've gotten from the public and just kind of our own internal kind of conversations. Uh, people have probably been wondering, since the museum has been closed for basically 15, 16 months, uh, since March 15th, 2020 was the last time we were open to the public, obviously because of coronavirus and the pandemic. Um, people were probably wondering, what were we doing in there? particularly with the exhibits and with some of the other things. And we actually saw this as an opportunity. There's a, there was a tremendous challenge the coronavirus presented to the museum, but it also presented an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me. And one of the things we did, Kevin and I started talking, a couple others started talking, Greg Krieger, our curator of exhibits, several of the other staff. And we realized we had an opportunity while we're closed, all the things we've wanted to do to the exhibits over the years, we now have a chance to do them. And so, what we want to do today is we want to share with you some of what was going on and some of what uh, what we have done and some of the new stories that we're sharing um, and kind of the thinking behind it and things like that and just kind of whet your appetite so that when you come back and see us when we reopen and by the way Eric alluded to it within about a week or so we're going to announce our final reopening plans so stay tuned for that um, shortly after June 1st we're going to announce our reopening plans but in the meantime we wanted to Kind of showcase some of the new stories that we that, that we're including, but also um, just kind of share with you and kind of hopefully whet your appetite for when we reopen. Um, and Kevin has very helpfully put together some slides here. Um, I'll just walk you through by way of introduction, and then we'll move on to some of the stories because I know Kevin, I know that's something you you and I both like doing is telling telling stories and sharing some great history. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> So just real quick, just so everybody, uh, just to lay out some backgrounds of what we're doing and, and what, what underpins kind of the, the, the philosophical and historical underpinning of, of what we're doing and what the exhibit refresh is. Um, and that's basically what this is. It's a refresh. The exhibits, when you go in there today, are largely, or you did before the closure, were largely what was there in 1993. And there's nothing wrong with those exhibits. What was put in then, showcase the story very well. But in the meantime, there have been more things donated to the museum. There's been more stories that have been added to our collection. There has been greater understanding and actually in many ways more military history than what was there originally in 1993. And so we've, we've it's through that, the wanting to include those stories, wanting to include that history and, and amplify what's already in the museum that we decided to call this actually a refresh. It's not a full redo by any means, yeah. but it's a refresh. And so with that in mind, we took a fresh look at the exhibits with new eyes. Our mission, museum's mission remains the same. 
to acknowledge, commemorate, and affirm the role of Wisconsin veterans in the United States of America's military past and present. And that's one of the th points we want people to, to understand when they walk through. These are national stories. These are stories of international importance, but they're all tied to Wisconsin. They are all Wisconsin stories first and foremost. And so that's something that needs to be, uh, we, we wanted to make sure people understood is our big idea. The other part of the, this was the ethos, the three other big points we wanted people to walk away from, which is every veteran is a story, no matter when you served, where you served, who with, every veteran is a story and their stories deserve respect. Wisconsin was there. You're gonna get a taste of that in some of the stories that we share today. There are historical events that many people are probably very familiar with, but may not realize the Wisconsin dimension or the Wisconsin connection to them. And so we wanted to explore that a little bit. Wisconsin was there. And then the other last thing as well, this still matters. This history is not by any means dead and gone. In many ways, it still reverberates today. It still matters and it will continue to matter uh, long into the future from here. So that is the underpinning of the refresh and kind of what our thinking was. And this drills down a little bit further into kind of our, our thought process. Um, again, every veteran is a story. By extension, to know the person is to honor the service. So by sharing the story, preserving the story, to know the person, to honor the service. Again, we're refreshing the exhibits, we're adding and we're replacing stories. Um, we're also swapping out artifacts. There are some artifacts that have been on display since 1993, particularly uniforms that shouldn't really be on display that long because the lights can damage the artifact. And Kevin, I can see from your reaction, you, you, know, exactly, you, you, you know exactly where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. So we're swapping many of these out. Um, to add new stories, but also add new artifacts and give some of the older artifacts a rest and, and just to work to the preser further preservation of the collection. Uh, the refresh is underway. Um, it's gonna be in place by reopening. And the last thing I'd point out to you is, is the refresh in some ways is never really going to end. About every six to 12 months, we're gonna be swapping out certain elements of the, st of, of the exhibits. Part of that is for the preservation. Um, these, these artifacts, people tend to forget the artifacts that are donated to the museum. We are charged to keep them in good shape so that 150, 160 years from now, which are for many of our Civil War artifacts, they're that old. In fact, all our Civil War artifacts are that old. They have to be available for people to study, to be inspired by, and to still be able to, to be around for. Um, and that's true from any, any of our oldest artifacts all the way up to even our most recent artifacts. Um, and so by swapping them out off display from time to time, you give them a rest, you contribute to the preservation. But the other reason, which is just as important, is we keep the museum fresh. The idea is every time you come back, you avoid that, oh, I've been there, I've done that, I don't need to go back and see it. You avoid that. That's also why we do special exhibits of which we'll hear more, more later this year about with our next special exhibit. Um, but that's one of the ways we do that is avoid that. Oh, been there, done that. I don't need to go back and see it. Well, come back and see it because there's probably something new based on the last time you were here. So that's the underpinning of the exhibit refresh. Um, and Kevin, at this point, I will, I will stop talking and let you let, hand the ball over to you to kind of talk about this guy and kind of get us going on the, on the stories we're going to share. Sure. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, and you're exactly right. You know, the, the galleries as they currently are, are a product of their time, um, which isn't bad. And, and they serve a purpose. It is that, that curatorial linear model. It's a very timeline model. And in some cases, some people would call it, you know, a textbook on a wall, um, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, it provides that context. But we have an opportunity to really showcase those Wisconsin stories um, that you can't necessarily find elsewhere. Uh, and one thing that I always say now, too, is uh, on any tour that I give, you know, in 1993, you know, you didn't have a computer in your pocket like you do now today. Uh, today, you know, you can find some of those facts that are in and, and some of that in interesting context, contextual history elsewhere. So let's provide something that you can't find elsewhere. And that's going to be those Wisconsin stories. And uh, to build off of what, Chris, you were saying, uh, one of the first things that you're going to see as you walk in to the uh, museum uh, after, after we reopen 
is going to be what we would call our calling um, or our, our uh, I guess I would say even even a foundational quote. It's a, um, it's a charge. We, it's we a charge, the yep. charge from the charge from the veterans. And uh, this this in particular, if you're familiar with with the history of the Veterans Museum, originally known as the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Hall, uh, comes from a very important individual, one of the very first people uh, to be essentially my job. He was the first caretaker, uh, actually the first Chris's job even, because the caretaker was the director, the curator, the educator, um, all of that. Um, so that one of the very first people to have that position uh, was Jose Arud, who was a Civil War veteran himself. And he actually establishes really the intent, I would say, of the institution. Wouldn't you say, Chris? I would agree. I would agree. Um, and you can see here in this quote, the last lingering desire of these old veterans, referring to Civil War veterans, uh, so far as their country is concerned, is that they may leave it enshrined in the hearts of the young men and women who are so being educated as to become leaders of thought and purpose in their day and generation, and that they shall transmit an intelligent love of country to those of generations yet to come. And this is a very powerful statement. You know, it, it's over a hundred years old. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference, actually. It, it still resonates with us today and everything that we do and what the Veterans Museum is called to do and to continue passing on uh, to the next generations. And it's a great transition part because what we're going to do today is actually walk through the gallery space with you. Uh, and so I've got some images here of the galleries as they were, and then and mostly, and they still are. You're gonna, it's not like we've taken and gutted everything. Uh, as Chris said, it's not a complete redevelopment. We're actually augmenting and adding uh, things. So you may see things in different cases. You're gonna see different images. And we're gonna talk just a little bit about some of those today, but we don't wanna give away everything because we do want you to come in and actually see it as well. Uh, so this is more of a teaser, if you will, and kind of give a little bit about those behind the scenes um, and what uh, what kind of inspired us to tell different stories and, and, and look into different directions. And we start, of course, as everyone knows, with Wisconsin and the Civil War, because the Civil War is the first conflict that Wisconsin sends troops to, uh, or send, uh, provides troops to as a state. Uh, because, of course, in 1861, Wisconsin is a very young state. It's a very small state. There's only about 775,000 people in the entire state. Uh, we're only about 13 years old. Uh, so one of the big things we really wanted to capture in this area, you're going to notice as you walk in the gallery space, uh, off to your left is going to be a new touch screen. And the touch screen is actually going to give us an opportunity to kind of explore a little bit more in depth about who was Wisconsin in 1860 and 1861. And in order to do that, we actually uh, dug into the census records from 1860. And I'm going to pull up here because this is one of my, so this is the, so those of you that have heard me talk before, you know, I like to talk about the humanity behind the history, but I also acknowledge the importance of the statistics and the facts uh, as the context. So here's the statistics portion for everyone, uh, if you're interested. Um, this will all be translated, like I said, into a more engaging visual component uh, on this touch screen. But I want to put this out here um, because this was really fascinating things to go through and, and to kind of try and capture that essence of who was and what was Wisconsin in 1860. So we went through the census records and we actually were able to break it down um, by quite a bit. Uh, so if you notice, uh, for instance, here, Wisconsin, for those that were actually only born in the state, out of 775,000 people, only 247,000 were actually born in Wisconsin in 1860. Um, considering we were only 13 years old, that's not entirely surprising, uh, but that also means that those 247,000 are probably 13 or younger. Um, so that's a significant number as well. But I find it very interesting that more people were born outside the United States that were currently living in Wisconsin in 1860 than were born here in the, in the state itself. Um, now, Couple things that I always keep in mind with statistics, especially with census data, is that we know uh, that here you have those born, so these immigrants if you, uh, from different countries uh, are obviously born in those countries. We don't know how many within the native born, if you will, as, as they say in the census, um, but the US born, like for instance, if they were born in New York, we don't know if they're children of immigrants or if 
their family immigrated, uh, you know, decades ago kind of thing. So we don't know necessarily if they're, you know, first generation, second generation, or, you know, 17th generation necessarily. Um, but it's, you know, we, if we're looking at, you know, we, we all know Wisconsin is a very German state, right? Uh, it's, it's a very, got a heavy German population. And that makes sense because you have the largest immigrant group in the state at the time are from the German states. Um, Prussia, Bavaria, Austria, all these that you see over here on this side. Um, but right after that, uh, the next largest group is the Irish. And of course, the next one after that, the English. And then this one actually is the, one of the more intriguing ones to me. I just did a talk recently on the 15th Wisconsin, uh, which was, uh, of course, as we know it today, is the Scandinavian Regiment. Uh, and I'll bring this one up because it's, it's fascinating um, why you have these Irish regiments and the German regiments and uh, all these things because this, you know, the 26th Wisconsin was an all German regiment. The orders were given in German and or given in English by the colonel and then translated into German by the captains to their individual commands and things like that. But the Scandinavian regiment of the 15th Wisconsin is very interesting because I think it's the only Scandinavian regiment in the entire war on both sides, um, primarily because out of, uh, for the, especially for the Norwegians, out of the 40,000 uh, Norwegian immigrants that are living in the United States at the time, 21,000 are living here in Wisconsin. So half, over half of those uh, immigrants are living here in Wisconsin. Now, Hans Hegg, who commands the regiment, he actually then uh, recruits for his regiment in other places other than just Wisconsin. So the 15th Wisconsin had people from Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Now that's what we would call today the upper Midwest. And that's a significant reasoning for that because out of all those states, remember that's 40,000 from Nor uh, immigrants from Nor Norway, 40,000, I'm sorry, 41,000 immigrants in the United, entire United States, 40,000 live in Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, or Wisconsin. So almost the entire immigrant population from Norway is in the upper Midwest. Um, that are that are in the entire country at the time, uh, so it's a we we have a significant uh, population here and story there with with the Norwegian experience, the Norwegian immigrant experience. I also like to point out that we always think of Wisconsin as uh, we are a state of farmers, uh, no different in 1860. In fact, probably more so in 1860, because out of a entire uh, workforce at the time that was documented in 1860 of 233,000 people, you have over half, uh, 1,225,000 uh, are, are actually either farmers themselves or working on a farm. Um, so over half are actually uh, in that business. And so it makes a lot of sense uh, that that's part of our state identity, especially in 1860 as well. That's the pretty other fascinating. Part, it's, it's really fascinating when you start breaking it down and looking at like, okay, so we know we have a lot, of, you know, we know we have a lot of Germans because that's who we are as Wisconsin, but why, you know, what, what is that? And that's actually one of the fundamental questions that we're trying to answer as we go through these things, uh, through this process, which is, you know, what's the fundamental question of history? Fundamental question of history generally is what, but really, truly the deeper fundamental question is why? Uh, so when you start looking at, you know, why is the 15th Wisconsin such a significant regiment? Why is it important that it's a Scandinavian uh, group? Because it's the entire immigrant population in the entire United States at the time, um, which makes a big difference. And then another fun one that I'm just going to show you some, uh, some behind the scenes. It's not a final product yet, uh, but a behind the scenes, since that's kind of what this is, uh, experience, is the other portion of that touch table is going to be talking about infographics and actually using Camp Randall as a good way to view the population breakdown of Wisconsin serving in the Civil War. So roughly 80,000, 81,000 um, Wisconsinites serve in the Civil War and you have 12,000 that you can see from this pie chart that don't come home, either killed in action or they die of disease or of wounds. Um, Camp Randall, total capacity, 80,000 roughly, and the student section has about 14,000. 
So when you start seeing these statistics translated into that visual way, um, hopefully that helps kind of put it into more perspective. Another way that you're going to see that, uh, hopefully here as we go through our touchscreen uh, development process, which we're still working on, is looking at the stadium itself, because the stadium itself sits on the location of the training camp, as we all know. The field is this location of the drill field at the time, as it was operating as a camp, as we can see from this map overlay. This is the footprint of the original training camp in 1860, overlaid with the map of what it currently looks like today. This is the drill field right here, the parking ramp and then the uh, football field would have been where you see, uh, especially that image of uh, famous Gaddis image. Um, you have the entire regiment would be lined up right here. Uh, so we're trying to take these visuals and give it into more perspective that people might understand. Um, one way I always tell in my tours uh, is if you've ever gone to a foot Badger football game, especially a Saturday morning one, uh, because let's be honest, the college kids aren't going to get there early. Uh, you usually see the student section completely empty at the beginning of the game. And that's a great opportunity to see what that would actually look like, what that percentage of loss would actually look like out of the entire 80,000 that serve. So that's something that we're still working on. We're still developing, uh, but th that'll be in place here this summer. And we're very, I'm very looking, much looking forward to that touch screen, helping set the context uh, for the story of Wisconsin in the Civil War. Well, let's see here. I talked a little bit too long about the Civil War. Sorry, Chris. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, one of the things that we did was myself, Kevin, and, and Greg Krieger, our curator of exhibits, divided up the museum in terms of the refresh. I took 1939 to the present and Kevin took 1938 back to 1860. And so that's why Kevin's talk, you know, that, that you, you'll see that division in lab, of labor in terms of the, how we share the stories with you today. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you're gonna see new images that we haven't had out before. You're gonna see, uh, add, and they're not necessarily gonna be massive, you know, photo enlargements. We're gonna kind of give you actually some little small things to look for, like this CDV, uh, from Old Abe. For those of you that have been in the gallery before, you'll probably know where it's going to be. <laughs> uh, give you a hint, look for the eagle. Um, but it's a great little story that goes with this CDV uh, that we're going to tell you uh, as well. This is a, a unique CDV of Old Abe, the War Eagle of the 8th Wisconsin, uh, because it's autographed, which is one of my favorite stories. Uh, one of the best souvenirs you could get from, I think it was the, the fair, uh, was it the World's Fair? I think it must have been. Oh, no, no, no. It was the, bicent uh, the, the centennial celebration, 1876 in Philadelphia. Uh, old, old Abe, uh, the War Eagle, got to go and be an, an exhibit, uh, if you will, which you could purchase uh, photos of him for souvenirs. But a for a little bit extra, you could get an autographed one. Uh, and you can see here that bite mark right across the photo. Uh, the beak uh, was there. And it, it's a great story because you can imagine, you know, his handler figuring out, okay, just take these photos and shove it in his beak and see what happens. And there we got an autograph copy. Um, but so that's a, you'll, you'll see these little things hidden uh, places. You're also gonna see images, uh, larger images uh, as we go through. One of the great story is John Jefferson, Colonel of the 8th Wisconsin as well. And he's gonna be an opportunity for us to talk about this idea of race actually as well in, in Wisconsin. Um, because John Jefferson, of course, is the grandson of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, he's buried here in Madison uh, and he actually talks, uh, we actually know about his story uh, from his, his own papers, but also from that of his family, Beverly, uh, who is also his brother uh, is buried here uh, as well. And they talk a lot about uh, this idea of having to pass uh, and, and being afraid that they're gonna be found out for being a descendant of a slave and Thomas Jefferson. Um, Which at the time in a segregated army would have meant expulsion. Exactly. And here he is, Colonel of the 8th Wisconsin, one of the uh, most known now today regiments of the state because of Old Abe in particular. Um, but the fact that he's grandson of a president of the United States and he's trying to hide that uh, is, is very interesting to me. So uh, we're going to talk about him as we go through. We're also going to talk about people like Henry Ashby. Uh, Henry Ashby. Is a, is a great example 
of those that didn't necessarily get uh, to, um, oh, my computer's crashing. This is good. There we go. Um, Henry Ashby didn't exactly uh, get the recognition that he deserved uh, at the time. So Henry Ashby, of course, uh, is actually a clerk. Uh, he's working for Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Clark of the 6th Independent Wisconsin Light Artillery. Uh, and he actually, uh, on several occasions, Clark himself testifies that he carried a musket uh, and he knew how to use it. He was actually wounded at the Battle of Corinth. Um, there's also some debate of whether Henry's uh, sister went with the regiment as well and helped because in 1893, uh, Colonel Clark actually writes selling, uh, telling, tell Henry I've not forgotten him or his kind, gentle sister who died near Corinth. Um, so there's, he serves with the, with the battery for all the from 62, July of 62 until the battery returns home in 64. And after the war, he settles in Stevens Point and Eagle River. Uh, he, is known by the veterans in his community. He's accepted as a local veteran of the member of, in the GAR post. Um, however, when he applies for an pen, a pension with, this, with the uh, federal government uh, because of his wound, uh, he, didn't, he had all the supporting evidence that he needed from his, his commanders, from the colonel especially, uh, and all that were white, of course. Um, but because he was never on the roster while he served, he was refused. He was refused a pension, and that was true for all non-rostered uh, African Americans who worked for Wisconsin officers and regiments. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a diverse experience in that capacity as well. All right. Am I still on the images? I can't tell. Yeah, he's uh, he's still up. All right. How about now? Yeah, it switched over. Hey, good. There's a weird uh, alert on my thing, so we're just going to pretend it's not there. <laughs> we're going to trans. We of course, as we go through the timeline, we're talking about connecting all these eras of history together as well. And you look at, of course, uh, stories from the Spanish American War. Here, you've got Earl Towers, who's over here on the right, serving with the Third Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry during the Spanish American War, uh, and they're all. All his comrades there are happen to be huddled around the 26th Wisconsin's monument at the battlefield of Chickamauga because that's where they're training only 30 years later. Um, so we're talking about this connection throughout history as well. It's not just isolated incidences. We'll talk uh, as you go through, you'll see more stories, uh, especially in the Spanish American War about Arthur MacArthur, a great uh, monolithic figure of Wisconsin history uh, and Wisconsin military history in particular. Uh, not at all an interest to Chris in the slightest, I don't think. <clears throat> um, but <laughs> uh, So we'll talk a little, you'll see uh, some more interpretation about him and his experience in the Philippines. Um, and of course, we've got King, Charles King, who again is just as uh, important in, in Wisconsin military history as uh, I would argue as the MacArthur's. Um, and someday we'll have to have a debate, Chris, about which one is more, <laughs> which family uh, or the McCoys. Ooh, that would be a good one. We could do a three-way debate with the McCoys, the Kings, and the MacArthur's. And as you, you walk, tell you're already sharpening your metal sabers on that one. <laughs> as we walk through the hallway uh, into the 20th century gallery space that everyone knows today, we're going to have actually a timeline of, of, of unit photos. So this is, of course, Charles Hansen from the Civil War. Uh, and again, connecting all these eras of history, because this isn't Yes, uh, uh, photography, photography, especially in the Civil War, was, a, was a, essentially a new thing, uh, and it was the, the cool new thing to do. Um, you see this desire to document comrades and service, and even, frankly, the poses, um, very similar throughout history. Uh, as we move from World War I into the Spanish-American War, uh, World War, uh, I'm sorry, Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, as you see here, World War II, of course, all the way through to the day uh, and, sh and seeing that continuity of, of documenting those that you serve with. Moving into World War I, uh, you're gonna see a few things, of course, along uh, the, uh, the um, Mexican border area that we talk about uh, eventually. I don't think right away, perhaps not in July, but I think this fall, because we're gonna do a program with it. Um, we're gonna have the essentially this idea of while the world was at war, 
um, because it's very easy to forget uh, that really World War I is 1914 to 1918. I would even argue, frankly, it's until 1919 especially for those coming back from Russia, uh, which we do have Wisconsin troops that are serving in Russia in 1919. Um, but anyway, so trying to sh put it into context, you know, the focus of the Mexican border area in our current gallery space does talk a lot about, um, actually, I think the next page. Yep. So you can see here the Mexican uh, border war there on the left talks a lot about the experience of Wisconsinites that are being uh, federalized and sent down to the border. Um, but we really wanted to remember that they knew what was happening in Europe, even though the United States doesn't join the war right away in 1914, it doesn't make them any less ignorant or unaware of what's happening and frankly, what's awaiting them once the United States does join the war. You know, well, if you headline... consider the, the population makeup of the state and exactly. particularly the waves of immigration that had started coming in the 1850s and certainly in the 1880s and 1890s from Europe. Yep. There are many people here that have families that are fighting when the war starts. Um, you wouldn't be, you know, you know teasing up uh, Wisconsin was where uh, talk at all, would you? Yeah, that's that's something actually in the course of this we've been developing and I want to develop further is researching Wisconsinites, particularly those that lie in Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries that fought with the Canadians, with the Australians, and some of them with the UK. We've actually mm -hmm. found a family from Fort Atkinson who came over when the war started. Their eldest son stayed behind and later gets uh, is taken prisoner by the Turks and dies in what is today Iraq and is buried in Baghdad. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of those stories and there's a lot of connection. Of course, Wisconsinites go, sir, go across the border and serve in Canada. Um, but there are some things here, you know, that, that really it, it rounds out the experience of Wisconsinites in these world events that may not necessarily have been, may not have had the, the light shown on it that it needs. Yeah, you're right. Uh, one of the one of the neat ones um, that I've come across neat is a, is always a relative term, of course. Um, I was trying to find the first time that a Wisconsin newspaper mentions gas, you know, a gas attack, because that's what everyone syn is synonymous with with uh, World War One is is chemical warfare. And I found this one from June of 1915, uh, the State Journal. This is uh, it's unfortunately it's not on the front page, but I just I showed you the front page earlier. Um, but this man here, Arthur Doe from Milwaukee, actually uh, is, was going to school in England when the war breaks out. And this is the first account that I can find of a Wisconsinite that experienced a gas attack. And this, he experienced it during the Battle of Ypres. I'm going to say that wrong, right? Or did I say it right, Chris? Ypres. Ypres. Ah, close man. enough. So close. close enough. <laughs> Um, but he this describes... is actually, by the way, the first gas attack, first chemical attack in history. Yep. And if you go, I have visited the battlefield. I visited there right after I graduated from college. I also visited where his hospital is. And when you go there, it the first of all, the battle space is real small. Yeah. But it is also extremely well commemorated. It's uh, the people of Flanders remember this action, and we have a Wisconsinite. Wisconsin was there. Yep, exactly. And this is this for me, because I've told Chris this, I'd love, you know, I, I love quotes, and I love to find those little moments. And, and that's kind of what we based Wisconsin was there off of, which is finding a Wisconsin connection to all these events, these big historic events that we learned about in grade school that are written, hundreds of books are written about, but let's find that Wisconsin connection. And the fact that there is a Wisconsinite that was part of that very first true uh, weaponization of chemical warfare that became, you know, the experience of everyone in World War I, essentially, um, was for me a, a great find um, to talk about Arthur Doe and his experience serving with the British Red Cross. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> this is part but, of the fun, though. We've been able to delve into the story and really explore Yep. and really bring out some some lesser known stories that deserve the light of day. Yep, exactly. And so I'm going to flip through a few here because I want to get to the the 20, your section, Chris, and not just have it be the me show. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we'll talk, you'll find some of those nuggets as we go through. So 
let's go right into, I would say, uh, the interwar period. Yeah, one of the things that we did, and to, to Kevin's point here, and we skipped through a couple things related to the flu, 1918 flu. Um, but one of the things that we focus on is that there's a photo here from one of the Wisconsin nurses in the flu. We actually, if you've read the Bugle, well, one of the last issues, we showed mm -hmm. this story. Uh, but if you could flip back, Kevin, um, where we start, this is actually, this is where most people think World War II starts. is 1941, Pearl Harbor, and then the Wisconsin National Guard deploys to New Guinea because we have this really fantastic display of the Battle of Buna with Australian, um, Australian tankers and, and American soldiers. We've actually expanded our whole series or a whole section. Uh, I call it Wisconsin at War, 1939 to 1941. Um, we look at, for example, Wisconsinites that go serve in Canada, the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Air Force. And through the process, we found a badger in, the, in one of the American Eagle squadrons that was shot down over, uh, over, in, uh, the, over Europe in 1941. We also look at um, Fritz Wolf, who's the badger flying tiger, if you will, is how the newspapers bill him, um, who flew with Claire Chenault and those famous flyers over in China. Um, we look at the Battle of the Atlantic, which the undeclared war that the U.S. Navy is fighting against the Germans, um, particularly in the last six months of 1941. And then we look at U.S. preparations for war, the peacetime draft, the call up of the National Guard, and then the Louisiana and Carolina maneuvers, which included, fun fact for you, we discovered in the process some Ho-Chunk code talkers. Mm -hmm. Everybody, when they think of code talkers in World War II, think of the Navajo code talkers with the Marines, and deservedly so. They rendered important service, but the Ho-Chunk were also doing the same thing with the 32nd Division of the Wisconsin Guard. And so we're going to highlight some of those stories. And then, of course, Wisconsin in, in, at Pearl Harbor. Um, there were a lot of badgers present at Pearl Harbor, and this is probably one of the iconic photographs of Pearl Harbor. Um, Battleship Row down here in the front. And if you look real carefully about halfway up Battleship Row, thank you, Kevin, with the cursors, USS Oklahoma. There were three brothers from, I believe it was La Crosse, the Barber brothers. Um, and when most people think of World War II and families losing all their sons in action at the same time, they tend to think of the five Sullivan brothers and deservedly so, I'm not taking away from them. But if you were from Wisconsin, your equivalent of the Sullivans were the three Barbers who were lost aboard USS Oklahoma and their bodies were identified later. And you can see here, this is five, 10 minutes into the attack and Oklahoma has already been torpedoed. You can see the oil in the water. and She's already listening over to port. Of course, if you've seen any of the movies about Pearl Harbor, you realize, you know, she rolled over completely to, and capsized. And many men, over 400 men on that battleship died um, trying to claw, literally claw their way out of the bottom of the ship. Yeah. Um, and they've recently been identifying many more bodies uh, through DNA, the unknowns that have been buried in the punch bowl. And so it's been, it's an incredible story, but that's a Wisconsin connection. We also have a great diary and photograph from this woman here, Rhoda Ziesler, who had just arrived um, had just arrived a month before and was assigned as a nurse to the Schofield Barracks Hospital. And she spends the whole war there, as a matter of fact. She's on, she's on duty on the morning of December 7th and is on duty for 48 hours straight. And when she's done, she comes back to her bunk and basically stream of conscious partly to divest herself of everything that she had just experienced in the hospital during the raid and aftermath over the last two two days brain dumps right into the diary and it is it, 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 you talk about a powerful at the moment mm -hmm. both in a visceral emotional but also factual account um, Rhoda Ziesler's account is absolutely outstanding Along the way, the, the course of her service, um, the Hawaiian government uh, later has a thank you to Wisconsin veterans. She meets her old childhood crush who happens to be serving also in Hawaii. After the war, they end up getting married. So it's a, there's, a, there's a neat little story there as well. I mean, her, her story, and there's so many layers to her story. It's oh, yeah. something else. Yeah. Uh, well, but Rhoda Cecil, that's photo, a great story. The fact that this photo is from December 9th. It's the first photo taken uh, after the attack, and uh, she writes on the back, um, essentially that she had she had to put on the gown to cover up the mess that was on her front. Uh, but they did, you know, capturing that Wisconsin was there in the moment. Obviously, her and uh, her fellow roommates knew to that this is a historic moment to document that there's a need uh, to show their involvement. Exactly. 
this is another neat Wisconsin was there moment. Um, Roberta Wells was one of the first female Marines admitted in 1943. From 1944 and 45, she was in she was in Hawaii also. She was assigned to the public affairs office of Fleet Marine Force Pacific. In the process, in 1945, she developed a whole bunch of rolls of film from the battlefront at Iwo Jima in February of 1945, including this picture. This is the famous, many of you have probably seen it, the famous Joe Rosenthal picture of the flag raising at Iwo Jima, arguably the most famous picture of World War II, if not certainly one of the most famous in all of photography. Mm -hmm. She was the first person ever to see this picture because she developed the film in 1945. She's from Madison and Wisconsin was there. And that's something most people don't realize. This is more of our, our central gallery that we're, we're reworking some of that to tell a fuller story of World War II. Um, actually go back to Akira Toki. One of the other stories we're telling uh, many of you have probably heard of the 442nd, 100th Battalion, later expanded into the 442nd Infantry of Japanese American soldiers um, that have Nisei, first generation Japanese Americans, that fought with great distinction in Italy and France, and actually their most decorated combat unit of its size in the history of the United States Army. Um, we had a, one of them was from Wisconsin, Akira Toki from Madison, uh, joined the Army from an internment camp and served 43, 44, 45 with the, with the 100th, in the 100th Battalion and 442nd. And um, again, Wisconsin was there. Many people may have seen the, the, old, the film that was made years ago in tribute to them called Go For Broke, which is the regimental motto. Um, here's a Wisconsin connection uh, that we have that we're showcasing. John Jurstad is from Racine. And um, if you get a chance, ask Google about Operation Tidal Wave which is the dramatic raid on Ploesti, Romania, the, the um, critical uh, oil refineries at Ploesti, Romania. Uh, 177 B-24s going in low, and by low, I mean one of the pilots later reported, um, I brought back on the antennas underneath my plane, I brought back sunflowers and something that, quote, looks suspiciously like grass, unquote. Oh, That's how low they were. One of the leaders, one of the lead planes was, was co-piloted by John Jurstad. And uh, he and his pilot, um, Addison Baker, who was the group commander, um, got hit by flak and their engine caught fire, but they led their formation through the attack. And as they were trying to climb afterwards to let the crew bail out, the plane exploded. He and his pilot were two of the five medals of honor, the most ever awarded for a single air action in the history of the United States Air Force. Wow. And one of those five medals of honor was a man from Racine. And so Wisconsin was there. And of course, here's our Vietnam, Korea section, and then Cold War section. And we've got some stories here to run through pretty quickly. Um, we tended to try and add context to what was already there. This is a great story here. Ray Stubbe, who's from Wauwatosa, was a Navy chaplain during the Siege of Quezon in 1968. And uh, here he is doing a field, uh, field service, a black and white version of a color photo of him that later appeared in Life magazine, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, that cross there to the right and some of the uniform items that he has on are going to be going on display as part of the refresh. So you'll be able to see, literally look in the photo, see the cross, and then see the cross on display. A uh, really powerful way to connect that story over the 50 some odd years since, since this photo was taken. I'm going to throw off your game here quick and just mention also that throughout this pandemic uh, has been a unique opportunity for us as well because of this central island, right, Chris? Ah, uh, you're the USS Wisconsin, yes. Um, as many of you may or may not be aware, um, one of the newest ballistic missile submarines that the Navy has contracted for, uh, SSBN 827, is the USS Wisconsin. And she's the second ship of the Columbia class. And this is, uh, they're supposed to join the fleet 2031, 2032. We are already engaged with the new commissioning association and with the Navy and have expressed interest in collecting as much as we can about this new Wisconsin. We already have these collections related to the first Wisconsin, BB-9, the second Wisconsin, which Kevin was pointing out, BB-64. And we want to be a part of the full life of SSBN-827. And one of the things you're going to see just in case you're wondering, what's a ballistic missile submarine? What does it look like? You're going to be able to see a photograph on this island we're going to put there 
and talking about the Wisconsin is going to go back to sea and that name, that great name and that wonderful tradition over of over 100 years service to the United States Navy will write a whole new chapter beginning in 2031. And so that's something that you'll see here as well. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Another uh, Wisconsin was their moment, Berlin Airlift, 1948. Um, we had a Madison man, Russell Ramsey, who flew, donated his pilot's goggles, donated some of his flight gear, donated the medals that were given to him, um, and donated a variety of things. For, he participated in the, in the Berlin Airlift and helped keep West Berlin alive. Um, during the blockade of 1948 and 1949, which was really in many ways the first great battle, if you can call it that, of the Cold War. Um, and certainly the first great allied victory of the Cold War as well. And Wisconsin again was there. And that actually is all the photos. I think I lost some of the folders. That's fine. We've also got just, I think that's actually a pretty good way to, to summarize with one eye on the clock. Um, the Cold War section, if you could hover over the Cold War over there to the right of the periscope. Um, a tiny little have, thing right there. Yeah. <laughs> we have expanded that section as well. And we've added in some patches from, for example, the Flying Badgers, one of the air transport commands that flew, um, that flew troops from Milwaukee and from elsewhere to Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We've got some photos from a Wisconsin man who was stationed in West Berlin when the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. So you'd be able to see his, some of his personal photographs of that happening. Um, we've got some, some information about uh, a Wisconsinite who was on a spy flight over Russia that was killed. Um, we've got submarines. We've got a variety of different things um, related to Wisconsinites in the Cold War. And one of the things I'll point out to you as well is we talk about the Wisconsin Air National Guard. In case people ever wonder what's going on at Truax and what do they do at Truax, Truax Field then and now is critical to continental defense, defending against what goes over the pole. There used to be a radar station and we've got a little bit of a mention in, the, in that gallery on this. There used to be a radar station up at Anago, Antigo, Anago. Anago. Anago, thank you, up in the very Northern part of the state in case the Russians flew bombers or missiles over the pole. And Truax Field, since basically the 1950s, has been one of the key intercept points in case any threat yeah. comes over the pole. And it is an essential uh, interceptor base um, for, the, for the continental defense of North America. And so we get into that, the joint yeah. US-Canadian um, defense mechanism, which is still in effect, NORAD. Of course, most people know NORAD because of the Santa tracker every year. Uh, but we, you know, we talk about that and we just, we, we Again, try and explain and get people to understand that Wisconsinites don't always have to serve halfway around the world. Yeah. They're serving and defending the state and the nation right here every day. Yep. And that and is something yeah, that these are things that we're exploring throughout this section in this refresh. And that mission continues today because since 9-11, um, the, the Wisconsin Air National Guard has been essentially uh, the uh, patrol unit for that northern uh, sector. Um, so it's it's a that's what you when you hear them taking off and, and landing, that's part of those those operations. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's that's in a in a nutshell is again you know kind of a quick overview enough to whet your appetite. There's a lot more. I mean, we gave you the tip of a very large iceberg. Um, in this presentation, but we wanted to give you a sense of, of what's there or of what we've been doing and what you'll see when you come back to the museum and some of the, some of the great stories that we've been able to shine a light on, um, you know, as, as we go forward and as we continue to, you know, keep, we, we want to keep this place, want to keep the museum a, a living place. And through doing this, this is an opportunity to, it's an opportunity to explore in that direction. So Kevin, I don't know if you've got anything else to say before we throw it open for questions. I think I'll, I'll just end with, like I said, some of it's gonna be larger things that you're gonna see, like we're gonna switch out some, some casework um, and you'll see some of these things. Some of it's gonna be real small um, and it's kind of gonna be a fun uh, point out, you know, what you find different. So I think we might, we might explore the idea of doing a type of scavenger hunt uh, throughout the summer uh, and see if people can point out to us what is new from what was different or what's different since when we closed a year ago. 
um and when we reopen here because and that's something we actually might explore in the future too as we continue like chris said it's going to be a living process it's going to be continual so we'll we may you may see us on social media asking if you can find what's different uh between these two pictures type things and i think with that eric we will toss it back to you uh, i just want to thank everybody for coming and playing along and um uh, Look forward to any questions that anybody has, and then looks like we got about 10 minutes or so before we hit the, the magic hour of one o'clock. So Eric, I'll throw it back to you. I'll bring those questions up right now for you, Chris. Uh, so the first question, uh, what process did the staff go through to, to determine uh, what parts of the museum would be changed? Kevin, this kind of originated from you, so I'll let you take the point. So this this was something that we've always wanted to do. Um, we've ever since essentially uh, ten years ago when we started talking about exploring how to how to freshen up the interpretation. And, and when I came on staff, that was one of the things that we really wanted to build upon um, because it, it is exciting what we have these stories that we have so much has changed uh, in terms of our collection since 1993, uh, that as everyone or in this call usually knows, um, there's only 3% of the entire collection on display at one point in time. So we actually decided to look at the entire uh, exhibit, uh, the entire uh, gallery as a whole, or the entire museum as a whole, because we knew we wanted to insert these interpretive elements that every veteran is a story, Wisconsin was there, and it still matters into all aspects of the museum. Uh, sorry, Kevin, I, I accidentally advanced to the next question That's part, all right. while you were talking, uh, but there was a, a few mentions earlier in uh, the presentation about CDVs and somebody was curious of what that is. What's a CDV? CDVs are carte de visites, uh, essentially, uh, like I showed you with uh, the image of old Abe there, the war eagle, um, lack of a better term, and this is going to sound uh, kind of dumb probably, but it's essentially baseball cards uh, of the Civil War era, but it's a way for uh, fairly cheap reproductions of images from the Civil War time uh, where people could get, you know, 10, 12, think of it like a, a school portrait day uh, in grade school when you'd get, you know, all those uh, six or eight or whatever in those boxes and you'd kind of switch them with your friends, hopefully, maybe, or maybe that was just me. I don't know. Um, but that's kind of what, that's what a CDV is. Okay, now the slide doesn't want to advance when I want it to. Uh, with so many veteran stories to tell, how do you decide which ones to use, guys? Chris? I think the, the, the part of this is why we want to rotate is because we found we had an absolute embarrassment of riches. Many of the times what we look at is we look at availability of materials in terms of what, what's, what do we have that we could put on display. Um, we also look at, for example, who the veteran is, where they served, branch sometimes. And a lot of times we'll consider, you know, what, what haven't we told? What do we need to tell? What is underserved in some way, shape or form, depending on a variety of factors. Um, and so all that goes into the decision is in terms of what we want to you know, what stories we want to tell, what we want to include. One, I'll use one example. Um, Roberta Wells um, is underserved. Women Marine, there's not a lot of them during World War II. And of course, her connection to Iwo Jima was an X factor that made her story instantly recognizable and um, connectable to people. We had never really done anything on the Berlin airlift in our exhibits. Right. That's why Russell Ramsey went, into, went in there. Um, you know, and there, there are many other cases, but I'm just using those two kind of as exemplars um, to think about. But one of the things we do want is when people walk through the doors, we want people to be able to recognize themselves or recognize some aspect, something that they can relate to. And by we try and find stories that can relate to the widest swath of our audience and the widest swath of, of people that will visit the museum. There's a couple of things we always say, uh, and one of them is a t kind of a tagline, um, is that really, in, in the end, we're a museum of people. 
and we're a museum of stories, not a, not a museum about you know war, um, and and to capture that humanity behind that history. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I always tell people, uh, and I've told them for ten years, so forgive me if it's redundant uh, to people that have heard it before, but the museum in many ways is the microphone, and the veterans are the voice. We are simply the conduit to get their experience out there. You don't need uh, you don't necessarily need to hear you know my analysis of it uh, as much as uh, I think you need to hear what their feelings what their emotions what their experience was thank you guys thank you. um next question how often should a museum change their exhibits and stories some of this honestly depends on funding and resources mm -hmm. um the general rule for um artifact preservation. For example, this shirt that I'm wearing right now, if we put this on display for a year or two, it would completely fade under the light. Just every day under the light, eight, 12 hours a day. It should come off about every six months to a year. And that is true of just about every textile uniform item that we have. Now, some things like the aircraft and the tank, not a problem. They can be out for, for years, decades even, and they have. Yeah. Um, it depends on the material. But generally, uh, what we look at is we look at every six to 12 months doing that, both from a preservation standpoint, but also from a, to relate to an earlier question, a veteran's stories sharing standpoint. It's also, uh, a, a, if you think about it, it depends on the museum. Um, not only their resources, but also what their collection looks like. If you have a museum that their entire collection, you know, 98% of their collections on display, then you're not changing necessarily or rotating things in and out. Um, it is kind of what it is. Whereas we are very fortunate in that we have such a large archive and object collection and oral history collection. Um, the, this is the last question on the PowerPoint, gentlemen, uh, and then there's a couple that came in uh, late that I didn't get on there. Um, but what are the plans for the rotating, uh, quote unquote, section of the museum in the near future? And I think by rotating, I, th I think this, uh, this guest is talking about our temporary exhibit yard. Our next temporary exhibit, and I'm going to give this the very, very short version, because Kevin, I know you and I are going to do a program on this later this year. Yep. Um, is about every year and a half to two month, to two years, we do a special exhibit in our in our backs, one of our back sections. Um, and the next one coming up is gonna open in November called Souvenirs of Service, the things they kept. And we're gonna look at everything from the Civil War to present operations. And what did these soldiers bring home? I mean, everybody in the audience knows what souvenirs, probably has souvenirs from various aspects of their life. Um, I've got several behind me, as a matter of fact, souvenirs. Let's look at what the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and the Marines brought back from their various services and to memorialize. Um, and so that's the next exhibit. Stay tuned. There's a lot more on that coming up later this year. I'm still waiting for the Space Force souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all really excited about that. Um, I know it's been quite a while in the making simply because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it'll be nice, uh, especially for Kevin, uh, to have that wrapped up and, and ready to, to, to display. And then we move on to the next one. And we move on to yeah, the next that's one. That's right. Um, we did have a question, uh, and it kind of touches on what you talked about, Chris, when you were talking about how often museums should rotate their exhibits or change artifacts. Um, and this question uh, states, is this refresh being done with in-house talent, or are you reaching out to any uh, outside exhibit companies? We are primarily doing this in-house. Um, we have talent. We, we have the talent, yeah. Um, yes, Kevin, Kevin, myself, and Krieger may be the, the lead people, but our archives people, actually one, a lot of these stories, it just was asking several of the team, what have you got that you've always wanted to see on display? Like Rhoda Ziesler being a perfect example. Our archivist, Brittany, said, this is a cool story. We need to work it in. And it, of course it was an easy thing to do because it was an amazing story and had some great elements that would display. Um, it's really been a team effort in many ways, even though Kevin and I are up here being the public faces right now, it's been the entire staff. There are some places like, for example, the touch table, we've engaged uh, outside consultants to develop those. 
Um, Department of Administration does our printing for us. But in terms of, you know, generating the content in house, um, that's us. That's this team, this elite team um, that I'm proud to be the director of. So, Kevin, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Oh, that, that was very complimentary. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the last question we have today, gentlemen, is we have a guest who has never been to the museum and they would like to know how much time should they allot, uh, you know, if they wanted to come and visit and, and, and see what we have. Um, how much time do you think they should uh, plan for? That's a very good question. If you want to get question. the beer and pretzels overview, I'd say an hour, and a, hour to an hour and a half. If you want to stand there and read everything, it's going to take you, it's going to take you a little while. Yeah. So it just entirely depends on what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of time frame you have. With uh, exhibit design, um, there's, there's a couple different philosophies. And I mean, if you, it depends on the, the person, Chris is exactly right. Cause you could buzz through a museum in 30 minutes. Um, but we also d design these experiences because we're designing a visitor experience really um, with multiple layers and levels so that if you do have a couple hours, three hours or so to dig and you want to find all these little small you know, nuggets that we're hiding or, or not hiding, but we're, we're uh, putting out there for people to dig into more if they have the time, great. Um, and if they don't, that's okay um, because you're still going to get that an experience no matter how much time you spend. Um, but yeah, we usually say about 90 minutes. Well, I believe that's all the questions, gentlemen. Thank you so much for updating us on what's been going on at the museum since uh, we've all been locked away from the museum. Um, and as we alluded to er earlier in the program, we are really, really anxious and hoping to get back very soon, uh, throw open our doors and welcome everybody back in. Um, but like Chris said, announcements will be coming um, around shortly on that. Uh, but in the meantime, you can always tune in to any of our events that we have going on. Uh, they are listed on our website, wizvetsmuseum.com. Under the events section, uh, a lot of events coming up this summer on our virtual platform. Um, and hopefully we'll be announcing uh, very soon some maybe some in-person events. Uh, that's very exciting for us to be able to even talk about that. Um, but yeah, just uh, keep up with us in our events, our curator conversations. Uh, you'll learn more about the museum. You'll learn more about what happens behind the scenes and how, uh, as Chris alluded to, this amazing staff uh, takes everything, puts it all together, uh, and is able to put it out there for the general public uh, and our veteran populations. Chris, Kevin, thanks so much for uh, sharing everything with us today. Our pleasure, Eric. Certainly and, is. And uh, oh, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Nope, so it certainly is. It's always fun. Excellent. Um, and for everybody who's joined us for our conversation today, we want to thank you so much. And we hope to see you back uh, for more of our events uh, coming up this summer. Thanks again, everybody. And I hope you have a great Monday.